Well, good morning, church. This morning, we're continuing on our study of the Apostles' Creed, and we come to that first line in the third section of the Apostles' Creed that speaks of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to take your worship folder out and just follow along as I read what we have seen and looked at so far, and then introduce the line that will be, again, our consideration this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And then the first line of this third section, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Section one, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Section two, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Section three, I believe in the Holy Spirit. This morning, I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, where I want us to look together at verses 5 through 15. The Gospel of John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. If you have found your way there, would you join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Jesus says to the disciples, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, grief has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I am leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes will convict the world regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. Regarding sin, because they do not believe in me. And regarding righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you no longer are going to see me. And regarding judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them at the present time. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, and this is why I said he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Let's pray together. Our great God and Father, this morning we surely are on holy ground as we begin to think about the Holy Spirit. We do pray, Father, that you would hide the one who preaches this morning in the shadow of the cross. And as we enter this holy ground and our minds are set upon the Spirit of God, This morning, we pray especially that we would not just be challenged, but more importantly, changed, not just confronted, but conformed to the image of him to whom the Spirit points. We uh, we praise you today for your goodness and grace to us, and uh, we anticipate what you're going to say to us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. The text we just read, just in passing a conversation, uh, that he will come, the Spirit of God, and will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. You know that in the Old Testament, God also sent prosecutors that prosecuted ancient Israel, their kings, their prophets, and so forth, the people. And those prosecutors obviously were the prophets. But in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, God doesn't just send a prosecutor. He sends one who will render verdict, who will convict the world, sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And, of course, that is the Holy Spirit. As we begin considering this third and final section of the Apostles' Creed, the focus is on the work of the Holy Spirit. 
As I began to prepare this message, my first thought initially, categorically speaking, and you may be an exception to this categorical statement, and it is this, that I believe the Holy Spirit is probably the most neglected member of the Trinity. We talk a lot about God, we talk a lot about Christ, we sing a lot about God, we sing a lot about Christ, but the Holy Spirit is sort of that unknown. We don't know, I believe, the Holy Spirit like we should. I don't think we seek the Holy Spirit like we should. Uh, I don't think we worship the Holy Spirit like we should. And the evidence is really there. There aren't a lot of hymns about the Holy Spirit. Not a lot of sermons you've heard have been about the Holy Spirit. Devotions, reflections, just as a general, general statement on my part, most neglected member of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit is also... So unfortunately, the most exploited, most misrepresented, most misunderstood, um, charlatans, you name it, have done what they've done and gotten by with what they've gotten by with because they have shrouded themselves and their work evil with the Holy Spirit. Now, by and large, again, most neglected member of the Holy Spirit when I began to prepare, not this, just this message, but as you'll see in a minute, the message is to come, and I began to look at the Old Testament and what it has to say about the Holy Spirit, I began to look at the New Testament, what it has to say about the Holy Spirit, what Jesus had to say about the Holy Spirit and the apostles. When I began to look at the early church and the patristics and the Puritans and the reformers, what they had to say about the Holy Spirit, even when I began to reflect on what current or even recently past theologians have had to say about the Holy Spirit. Uh, what appears to me to be the case is what Christianity, all of Christianity, all of Christianity has had to say about the Holy Spirit appears to me to almost be endless, vast, vast. And why is that the case? Because the, the scriptures speak of the Holy Spirit in such a way that it reveals to us, and words are not adequate, this incredible breadth of truth. I mean, far-reaching, incredible implications about the work and person of the Holy Spirit. The work and person of the Holy Spirit is as profound and as far-reaching as you and I can possibly imagine. And yet, he is the most neglected member of the Trinity. Just in broad theological and biblical categories, when I began to look at truths concerning the Spirit, just broad categories. I mean, I ran into works and treatments by various people through all the course of the Christian era on subjects like the person of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is comfort, the Holy Spirit is paraclete, the Holy Spirit is the sign and seal of the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is God's prosecutor, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and the Christian sonship, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in prayer, the Holy Spirit in the inspiration of Scripture, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being baptized with the Holy Spirit, being moved by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in the act of preaching, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, the Holy Spirit in creation, the Holy Spirit in new creation, the Holy Spirit in evangelism, the Holy Spirit in the church, the Holy Spirit as the giver of life. I could go on and on. And we don't know anything about them, categorically speaking. And I really this week felt an enormous spiritual burden on me as pastor for us as a church that we all, beginning with me, need to better understand, to know better, and to benefit more from the Holy Spirit. So what I want to attempt to do over the next several weeks is to consider the remainder of the Apostles' Creed with the Holy Spirit in the foreground to not separate the first line of that third paragraph from the remainder of those statements of faith, but rather to look this morning beginning, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and in the weeks to come, the Holy Spirit in the Holy Catholic Church, the Holy Spirit in the communion of saints, the Holy Spirit in the forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Why is that? Because apart from the Holy Spirit, there would be no church. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, there would be no communion of saints. 
Because apart from the Holy Spirit, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, there would be no resurrection of the body, and there would be, apart from the Holy Spirit, no life everlasting. So as we begin this journey, I pray for God's help for me and for you as listeners and thinkers and worshipers to think deeply about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the way he is treated in Scripture, is utterly unique. And what I mean by that is this, that on one hand, when the scriptures speak about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is attributed with the greatest power in the universe, unparalleled and unequaled power. The Holy Spirit can do what nobody and nothing else can do. Yet on the other hand, The Holy Spirit is depicted in God's word with utmost meekness, tenderness, and sensitivity. On one hand, unequaled power, and yet on the other hand, unequaled tenderness. As the theologian G.I. Packer said, he is the shy member of the triune God, and he is. Holy Spirit is presented to us by God with the claim of unknown power and at the same time, unknown gentleness. There is nothing, there is no one like the Holy Spirit in all the universe. And unfortunately, when the Holy Spirit has become the calling card to many in false claims and ministries and purporting this, that, and the other thing, the Holy Spirit is often being depicted in ways that are so strikingly the opposite of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would never be engaged in vaudeville, white suits, people falling on the deck, claim it, name it. No, the Holy Spirit is powerful, but he is meek and gentle. There is nothing and no one like the Holy Spirit in all of the uh, the universe. In 1900, one of my favorite theologians, the late Dutch theologian and prime minister of the Netherlands, by the way, a man by the name of Abraham Kuyper, published a work titled The Work of the Holy Spirit. And to give you a sense of what Kuyper felt, and I feel too, uh, let me quote the introduction to that work. Kuyper wrote, The need of divine guidance is never more deeply felt than when one undertakes to give instruction in the work of the Holy Spirit. So unspeakably tender is the subject, touching, as it were, the innermost secrets of God and the soul's deepest mysteries. And he talks about our natural world, our families. He says, we shield instinctively the intimacies of kindred and friends from intrusive observation. And nothing hurts the sense of heart more than the rude exposure of that which should be not unveiled, being beautiful only in the retirement of the circle of the home, even greater. Even greater delicacy benefits our approach to the holy mystery of our soul's intimacy with the living God. Indeed, we can scarcely find words to express it, for it touches a domain far below social life where language is formed and usage determines the meaning of words. Concerning the spirit, Kuiper writes, glimpses of this life in the spirit have been revealed, but the greater part of them is withheld. It is like the life of him who did not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. And that which was heard was whispered rather than spoken. The soul breath, the soft but voiceless, or rather a radiating of the soul's own blessed warmth. Sometimes the stillness has been broken by a cry or a rapture shout, but... There has been mainly a silent working, a ministering of stern rebuke or sweet comfort by that wonderful being in the Holy Trinity whom with stammering tongue we adore as the Holy Spirit, end quote. I agree. I agree. This morning we are on holy ground when we speak of the Holy Spirit. This morning, as we begin this third and final section 
which states, I believe in the Holy Spirit, all I want to do this morning is to attempt to introduce the subject of the Holy Spirit and then begin to deal with the Holy Spirit's role in all of these succeeding statements of faith. So this morning, who or what is the Holy Spirit? Simply stated, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. A person. The Holy Spirit isn't an energy. He isn't a cosmic dynamic. He isn't even the conscience. He's not a force. He's not something subconscious. He's not a principle. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. And the scriptures are filled with revelations concerning the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Let me read some for you. For instance, in Luke 12, 11 through 12, the Holy Spirit teaches. In Luke 2, 26, the Holy Spirit reveals. In Luke 10, 21, the Holy Spirit, listen, rejoices. Rejoices. Matthew 10, he speaks. Acts 1, 2, he gives orders. Acts 5, 12, he can be lied to. Romans 8, 26, he intercedes. Acts 7, 51, he can be resisted. Romans 8, 16, he gives testimony. How about this one, Ephesians 4, 30? He can be grieved. Romans 15, 30, Holy Spirit loves. 2 Corinthians 3, 8, he ministers. John 16, 7, he comforts. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he works. Romans 8, 14, he guides. Acts 13, 4, he sends. And even 2 Corinthians 13, 14, we can have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He's not a thing. He's not an it. He's a person. He's a being, a being, a person who teaches and reveals, rejoices, speaks, gives orders, can be lied to, intercedes, resists, who gives testimony, who can be grieved, who loves, who ministers, who comforts, who works, who guides, who sends, who we can engage in koinonia, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And when I say that the Holy Spirit is a person or a being, we all know that the scriptures are clear that there are only three kinds of beings in the universe. There are divine beings, angelic beings, and human beings. And that, uh, that gives way to the riddance of all kinds of other notions, like aliens and zombies and ghosts and all kinds of stuff. According to scripture, God's word, Divine beings, human beings, and angelic beings. The Holy Spirit is not a human being. The Holy Spirit is not an angelic being. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, a divine being. He is the third member, third person of the triune God, the Trinity. The Trinity. And any careful reader and student of Scripture knows that when the Bible speaks of God working, that God always works as the triune God. When God says something, he says something as the triune God. When he works, he works as the Trinity, as the Trinity. And what we find is that when God works or when he says something as the triune God or as the Trinity, that not only is the Father involved, but the Son is also involved, and so is the Holy Spirit. This is unambiguous. For instance, 2 Thessalonians, concerning us. Our salvation, our life, the church, everything that we're engaged in as Christians is all the work of a triune God. The Father's involved, the Son is involved, the Spirit is involved, always the case. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it talks about Christians as being, listen to this, beloved by the Lord, that's Jesus, being chosen by God, that's the Father, and being sanctified by the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian here today, you're a Christian because you are beloved by the Son, chosen by the Father, and sanctified by the Spirit. That's what it says. That's not unique. For instance, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, that's the Son, through the eternal Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, who offered himself without blemish to God, that's the Father. So in the councils of heaven for our redemption, what happened? The Son appeared before the Father, and his testimony was was vindicated by the Spirit. 1 Peter 1, 2, you who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, 
and sanctified by the work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ, the Son, and to be sprinkled, sprinkled with his blood. The entire triune God there. 1 Peter 4.14, if, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, that's the Son, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 1 John 4, 2, by this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ, that's the Son, has come in the flesh, is from God. The Father, the Son, all engaged. The Apostle Paul ends his second letter to the Corinthian church with the benediction. We use it as part of our liturgy often. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. When God works, he always works as a triune God, involving the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even the Great Commission, listen to this, the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of who? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are just verses. You have entire scenes, biblical scenes, where you see the triune God all represented. Take, for instance, the baptism of Jesus. What is taking place there? It says after he, that's Jesus, was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Guess what? The sun is there. And behold, the heavens were open, and I saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove, settling on him. The Spirit was there. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Father was there. Here you see, even at the baptism of Jesus, the Son, the Spirit, and the Father all present. All present. Holy Spirit is a person, he is a divine person, he is the third member of the triune God. And scripture reveals this, the deity of, Jesus, uh, of the Holy Spirit in various and but profound ways. Let me, let me share a couple ideas with you. One I'll call credit, just to give you an example. When I say credit, what I mean is this. When something God did or said is credited to the Holy Spirit, or when something the Holy Spirit did or said is credited to God the Father. So, for instance, in the Old Testament, Psalm 95, verses 6 and following, a familiar verse, says this, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. That's God. For he is our God, and we are his people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah or on the day of Manasseh in the wilderness. There is God speaking. And you'll remember Meribah and Manasseh refers to when Israel hardened their heart against God, and they struck the stone for water, complained, and all of that. Yet that same verse is quoted in Hebrews 3. Oh, in Hebrews 3, the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoke me, as on the day of trial in the wilderness. So what am I saying? Well, in Psalm 95, it was God who said it, but in Hebrews 3, it was the Holy Spirit that said it. You see another example of this idea of credit, for instance, in Galatians 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, not sent by men or through human agency, but through Christ Jesus and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ who was raised by God the Father from the dead. Yet Paul says, same writer in Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body through his spirit. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, it was the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. But in Romans 8.11, it was the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that raised Jesus from the dead. How can this be? How can this be? And the answer is that when God works, he always works as the triune God. Another example, in Genesis 2.7, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living person, a living being. Yet in Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God has made me, created me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. So in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God made man, gave him life, but in Job 33, 4, it was the Spirit of God who made man and gave him life. How can this be? Because God, when he works, when he speaks, he does so as the triune God. That's the idea of credit, and I could go on and on, trust me. The next word I'd introduce to you is the idea of interchange. Look with me, if you would, at Acts chapter 5. Look there. Acts chapter 5. This is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. 
beginning at verse 1, Acts 5. Just an example of not only credit, but interchange. Verse 1, but a man named Ananias with a wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, kept back some of the proceeds for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, verse 3, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to do what? To lie to the what? Holy Spirit. And to keep back some of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart, and you have not lied to men, but you have lied to who? God. Did Ananias and Sapphira lie to God, or did they lie to the Holy Spirit, or did they lie to the triune God? Everybody see it? Uh, same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And again, these are just samples. Uh, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Temple of the Holy Spirit. And yet, verse 20 ends by telling us that uh, God is to be glorified in our bodies. So is both the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, or is it God dwelling in us, or is it the triune God dwelling in us? Credit, interchange. But maybe the most telling statements concerning the Spirit's deity deals with the attributes of God. And when I talk about the attributes of God, there are incommunicable and communicable attributes. That is to say that some things, as God's creatures, we have possessed. God has given us when he created us. For instance, God can love. We can love. God has wisdom. We have wisdom or can have wisdom. But there are incommunicable attributes. That is, there's some things about God that, that aren't translated in his creatures, you and I. For instance, God is eternal. God alone is eternal. And by eternal, what do I mean? I mean that God is without beginning or without end. Only God is eternal. And yet Hebrews 9, 14, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God? You mean the spirit is eternal like God? I thought only God was eternal. Yeah, he is. So is the spirit. How about omniscience? That means God knows all things. He knows everything. God has never learned anything. Only God is omniscient. And yet 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among people knows the thoughts of a person except the Spirit of that person? So also, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Grasp that for a minute. The Holy Spirit knows everything that God knows. Everything. There is no thought that God has that the Holy Spirit doesn't know. Is that angelic? Is that human? Or is that God? What kind of being is he? Here's another one. How about omnipresence? God is everywhere at once. Everywhere at once. And some of us love Psalm 139. For many of us, I think it's one of our favorite psalms. And it poses a question. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from the Holy Spirit? Or where can I flee from the Holy Spirit's presence? If I ascend to heaven, guess what? Holy Spirit's there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, Holy Spirit's there too. If I take up the wings of dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there your hand, Holy Spirit, will lead me. Your right hand, Holy Spirit, will take hold of me. He's divine. If you're not convinced yet, here, here's a verse for you. I don't know how you wrangle around this. Do you know what blasphemy is? Here's a quick Webster definition. Blasphemy is an act or, or offense of sacrilege against God. For Pete's sake, the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. Matthew 12, therefore, if you say, therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. You can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Again, blasphemy, it is an act of offense or sacrilege against God. Holy Spirit is a person. He is God. He's divine. He is attributed with things that God did, things that God said. He controls things that God controls. He is attributed with the attributes, the uncommunicable attributes that only God possesses. He's God. A little bit about the name. 
the name Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament Hebrew, we find many passages where the Spirit of God is referred to many times. However, the complete name Holy Spirit only appears three times in the entire Old Testament. We read one of them in our liturgy this morning, Psalm 5111, where David writes, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Isaiah 63.10, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Isaiah 63.11, uh, where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them? In the Old Testament, the word Holy Spirit, or the name Holy Spirit, is Kodesh Ruach. Kodesh, Holy, Ruach, Spirit. Now hang with me. The name Holy Spirit in the New Testament, which is Greek, appears many times in the New Testament. From Matthew chapter 1, Mary was found pregnant by the Holy Spirit to Jude chapter 1, about praying in the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament Greek, hagios, holy, pneuma, spirit. Now importantly, all of that to say this, that both the Old Testament Hebrew, Hebrew Kodesh Ruach, or New Testament Greek, hagios, pneuma, both mean the same thing and carry the same ideas. Let's start with the word holy. What is holy referred to? Holy is the same word used of God's most preeminent attribute above all things. God is holy. God is thrice holy. Holy, holy, holy. And holiness is not just a moral character of God, and it is, but holiness ultimately means different. God is utterly and totally unique from all things. Moral, yes, but in so many other ways as well. Utterly unique. But you know what? His spirit is also holy. Holy. The second part of both the Hebrew and the Greek, ruach in the Hebrew and pneuma in the Greek New Testament, is that that word is uh, an onomatopoeia. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, both ruach in the Old Testament, and pneuma in the spirit is a word that imitates a sound. In English, onomatopoeia, crack, snap, bark, chip. Everybody got it? In the Old Testament, uh, ruach is onomatopoeia. It imitates sound. In the New Testament, pneuma is onomatopoeia. It imitates sound. And what is it that it imitates? It imitates both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament the sound of wind, the sound of a gale or a gust. You have heard people refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. That's bad translation because the word ruach or hagia or pneuma does not mean or mean to state uh, the idea of being immaterial that the Holy Spirit is immaterial or a phantom or an apparition, but rather it is the idea that the Holy Spirit is the sound of wind. It refers to the, the power of God, the control of God, the influence of God, the breath of God, the word of God. He is the force and the agency through which God accomplishes what he determines to accomplish. The Holy Spirit is that agent that is the one who makes sure and accomplishes that which God sets forth to be accomplished. The strength of God. The strength of God. Again, here's the, here's the kind of oxymoron. The Holy Spirit in Scripture is the most powerful being in the universe, and yet the gentlest and weakest and meekest. We see even in the creation when God is speaking out of nothing, ex, ex nihilo, out of nothing, fiat, by the sheer force of his power. What happens? What do we see? Out of nothing, there is the Holy Spirit who is hovering over the mass of, of, of non-existence. And God speaks, the Holy Spirit does its work, and God looks and says it is good. Look with me at Acts chapter 1 for a minute. Acts chapter 1, again written by Luke, the physician. Acts is the second volume of Luke's two-volume work. 
both written to a man named Theophilus, means lover of God. And notice what Luke says. The first account I composed, Theophilus, that's the Gospel of Luke, was about Jesus, what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And so the, the first account, the Gospel of Luke, is about the work of Jesus. Well, what will volume two be about? The book of Acts? It'll be about the work of the Spirit. Two volumes. Volume one, Gospel of Luke, work of Jesus. Volume two, book of Acts, work of the Holy Spirit. Notice verse two, until the day he was taken up after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he presented himself alive after suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, speaking of things regarding the kingdom of, of, of God. In verse four, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. When did the Father promise this? By the way, the Old Testament. We'll see it in a minute. But to wait for what the Father promised, which he said, You have heard of me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Again, verse 6, So when they had come together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel, or to Israel? But he said to them, It is not for you to know the periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set in his own authority. But notice, But you will receive what? Power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. Guys, don't go anywhere. Why? Because you are powerless. You wait until power has come upon you. And how will that power come? As I send my spirit. And again, Holy Spirit, unknown power coupled with unknown gentleness. There is nothing and no one like the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in all the universe. Look at John chapter 3. Familiar passage. So profound. So profound. Beginning in verse 1, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. No one could do the signs you do unless God is, is with him. So here comes Nicodemus. I want you to paint the scene. Here is the expert. Here is an expert, profound, like a Supreme Court member in ancient Israel. An expert who comes to vet Jesus. We're going to find out about Jesus, going to find out about what you're preaching, we're going to find out what you're all about. And uh, as I can observe, Nicodemus says, I know that you're from God because uh, the signs you do, you couldn't do without God. The expert. The expert to which Jesus responds, verse 3, says to him, truly, truly, there's the emphatic, truly, truly, I say to you, to Nicodemus, the expert, that unless someone is born again, he cannot categorical, universal, cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see it. You can't perceive it. You can't understand it. You can't know it. It's, 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 it's not available to you unless you're born again. The spiritual witness, the spiritual expert, excuse me, Jesus says essentially you can't really know anything, Nicodemus spiritually. You're coming here to vet me. You can't understand anything. Or as Paul would write, the natural man perceiveth not the things of God. He can't. He can't. And you see this, that he has no idea what Jesus is talking about. Verse 4, Nicus Demas says to him, how can a person be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb a second time and be born again, can he? Well, of course not. And then here's Jesus emphatic again, truly, truly, verse 5, truly I say unto you, unless someone is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Apart from the work of the Spirit, man cannot, fallen natural man cannot see the kingdom of God, cannot understand the kingdom of God, can't perceive the kingdom of God, much less enter it. No wonder Jesus says, it's, it's of your advantage if I go, because if I go, I'm going to send the Spirit. Why do we need the Spirit? Because we can't see, we can't perceive, we don't know. And we certainly can't enter. 
Verse 6, for that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Notice here is the gentleness of the Spirit. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it is coming from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is like the wonder of the wind. Nicodemus responded and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, You get this, you are the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Christine Rossetti wrote a poem that goes like this. Who has seen the wind? Neither you nor I. But when the trees bow their heads, the wind is passing by. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. How can a man be born again? Nick Demas cannot believe as an expert in Old Testament that seeing or even entering the kingdom of God is dependent upon the spirit-wrought work of being born again. He has no idea what Jesus is talking about. And I'll say this, that the average Christian in America has also no idea what Jesus is talking about. In the average church, in the average setting, being a Christian is about you be making a decision, you walking an aisle, you saying a prayer, all completely divorced of the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus says you cannot see, you cannot perceive, you cannot enter apart from the gracious Sovereign, almighty work of the Spirit, all-powerful and yet like a breeze. Truly, truly, make no mistake about it. I say to you, unless one is born of the water and Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you should know this. Why? Because it's, in, it's, it's, it's the great promise of the Old Covenant. It's the great promise of the Old Testament. You do get that, don't you? That in the Old Testament, we have a covenant of works. God says, do this and obey me and you'll live. And guess what? No one did it and obeyed. And so by the time you come to the Old Testament, guess what? Everybody's in spiritual doom. But smack dab in the middle of that Old Covenant, in the middle of that Old Testament, what, God, what does God do? He makes a promise. He makes a promise. There's many places I could turn to you, but look with me, if you would, uh, to Ezekiel 36. Here's one of them. Nicodemus, what I'm saying to you, you should know. Because it is the unmistakable promise of the Old Testament. In the New Covenant, I'm going to do something for my honor and for my own glory, God says. It is the centerpiece of the Old Testament promise. And you know what that is? The coming person and work of the Holy Spirit to do that in us as sinners, which the sinner you and I cannot do. Ezekiel 36, look at verse 22 and following. God says this, Therefore I say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake. What I'm about to do isn't for your sake, O house of Israel that I am about to act, but rather it is for, notice, for my holy name. This is what we call in my circles, our circles, reform circles, sola dia gloria. What I'm about to do, I'm going to do for the sole glory of myself, to the glory of God alone. And if you didn't get it that time, notice what he goes on to say. Verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And therefore the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself, here it is again, holy among you in their sight. Sola dia gloria. I gave you laws, I gave you commandments, you, you, you broke them, you committed idolatry, you committed every conceivable sin. Uh, I am your God, you are my people, and when the nations look at you, I am a laughingstock because you have sinned in their sight against me. 
Verse 24, for I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Here's the covenant. Verse 25, then, then, here's, unless a man be born again of water and the spirit, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Here it is. I will put my what? Spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances and you will live in the land that I gave your forefathers and so you will be my people and I will be your God. I'm going to do for you what you cannot do yourselves. I'm going to change your heart. And how am I going to change your heart? I'm going to send my spirit and my spirit will come and he will be within you. This is the new covenant. Centerpiece is the coming of the Holy Spirit to do what man could never do, the new enabling. Do you know how many times as a pastor I've been in a counseling situation over 35 years? Some of the cases, the things I've heard have been horrifying, sad, and terrible. And, and, and I've thought to myself, if I could change this person, I would. But guess what? I can't. And I've come to learn that I can't change myself, much less you. And you can't change yourself, can you? But you know who can change? The Holy Spirit. That's the power. It's the greatest power in the universe. It's the same kind of power that took nothing and made creation, made everything. It's the same kind of power that took the dead body of Jesus and brought it back to life. It's the same kind of power. You know, not just did the Holy Spirit's power create, but as Christians, we are said to be, by the Holy Spirit's power, new creations. Old things are what? And all things become by the Spirit. It's your advantage that I leave. Because if I leave, I'll send the Spirit. Because apart from the Spirit, there is no church. There are no saints. There is no forgiveness of sins. There is no eternal life. There is no resurrection. Look with me, if you would, for a minute at Romans chapter 7. The end of Romans chapter 7, Paul asks a question that every one of us could ask ourselves. Okay? Here is the question that every one of us could ask and should ask ourselves. It's found in verse 24, where Paul writes this, Wretched man that I am, that's me and that's you too. Wretched man who, that I am, here it is the question, who will set me free from the body of this death? Question mark. It's a good question. Who is going to save me from being who I am? Who is going to save me from the law of sin and death? Who is going to, who is going to exercise enough power to accomplish what, no, what nobody and nothing else could accomplish? That's the question. And the answer doesn't come until chapter 8. Where verse 2 says this, get this, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. Listen, depravity is real. It is bondage and it is damning. And we're all born under the sentence of death, enslaved and enchained to sin separated and alienated from God. And the question Paul is asking is, what power in the universe is able to set us free as sinners? And the answer is the Spirit. The Spirit. The Spirit is able to give life, to change a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, to take strident unbelief and turn it into faith to take rebellion and even hatred and enmity against God and turn it into love for God. 
It's unknown power, and yet he moves like the wind, meek and gentle, timid even. There's no one in the universe like the Holy Spirit. No one in the universe. The Holy Spirit is like the wind. You don't know where it comes from. I can look at my own salvation, folks. I don't know about your story, but I was lost, hard, and different to God. In fact, things that I had seen that related to Christianity were absolute turnoff to me. People on television, the street preachers in L.A., turnoff. Bible, foreign. I... And yet, in the fullness of time, I can tell you this, by hearing the word of God, the, spirit, the wind blew, and it changed me. I didn't change myself. No preacher changed me. The Spirit of God took out a heart of stone and put in a, a heart of flesh. And my strident unbelief and rebellion gave way to love and a desire to please God. And you know who I credit that to? The Holy Spirit. Um, you know how the Holy Spirit is really known? By his work. By his work. And, and guess what? He never points to himself. He never points to, he always points to who? To Christ. And once you're born again, I really believe that God gives you eyes to know the Holy Spirit. And you know how you know the Holy Spirit? With eyes that see his work. That see his reality. That see and know his power by observation. When I see a transformed life, I see the Holy Spirit. And frankly, let me end by saying this. For all of us, beginning with me, and maybe why I want to focus on the Holy Spirit with our remaining time in the Apostles' Creed, let me say this, that very little of the Holy Spirit for all of us is properly recognized. We just don't see him like we should or acknowledge him like we should. He's at work, mighty and powerful, but he's so meek, he's so tender, he's so unself-promoting that we don't recognize him unless we have eyes to see him. Let's pray together. Father, like the wind, like the wind for every one of us that are truly Christians and know you, like the wind, like the dove that landed upon Jesus' shoulder, the Holy Spirit imperceivably, unrecognizably, known only through the exercise of a power that is unlike any power in the universe, changed our lives transferred us, as Paul says in Colossians, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. Father, help us over these weeks to not only leave here this morning, but to think deeply and profoundly about the Holy Spirit. He is a wonder. He is a wonder. I fill our hearts full of wonder, love, and praise for him. And I pray that for all each of us, we would be given by your grace eyes to see his work, to know him by his power and his meekness. I pray this morning, especially for the person who doesn't know Christ, may the spirit of God do its perfect work in him or her. Give him a heart of flesh. Turn the rebellion and unbelief into faith, saving faith. We are yours because of your work, and when you work and when you speak, you always do so through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, we praise you this morning in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.